All right, thank you so much uh, for the introduction, Molly. So I'm really just here to give a short overview of the talk. We are going to do it in two parts, which are two separately funded MIT Integrated Learning Initiative projects. Jashita is going to do the first project on adaptive learning for physical tools. And then I'm going to present um, the second project really briefly at the end about how to use um, gaming to teach people making skills. So by having people create physical props for the game experience itself. So the sheet is going to kick it off for the first 20 to 30 minutes, and then I'm going to do 10 minutes on the recently funded project and just going to explain what we are planning for the research. And if any of you are interested in collaborating, we are very happy to have a discussion um, at the end and also throughout the talk. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and we are happy to have them. Okay, the sheet will kick it off. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Nishida, and I'm a second year PhD student with Professor Stephanie Mueller in uh, HCIE group at uh, CSAIL. And today I'm going to talk about my project on uh, adaptive learning of motor skills and the design of physical tools to facilitate that learning. Uh, so personalized learning, as we know, is uh, very beneficial because uh, it's a mode of instruction where the teacher adapts the uh, method of learning, uh, the difficulty level, based on the learner's skill levels. Uh, and studies have shown that this uh, mode of learning leads to higher learning gains. However, it comes with an inherent limitation when uh, imp implemented to a larger um, uh, class scale, uh, it kind of fails to uh, be scalable and uh, accessible for every student. So in the sense that only a limited students can get this form of personalized and individualized um, learning, uh, of, um, uh, learning of instructions. Um, uh, to address this limitation, researchers have developed uh, various online adaptive learning systems where each student can now have their own personal trainer on their iPad or on their desktop. Uh, and these form of systems vary the task difficulty based on how well the learner is doing. So a few examples on the right uh, show uh, learning systems for uh, learning of math. Um, uh, and geometry, where uh, the next question or the difficulty level of a question is dependent on how well the, uh, or how fast the student um, is able to solve the problems. But when it comes to learning of motor skills, we are still limited to uh, personalized training using coaches or trainers, uh, where the trainers will adapt the difficulty level uh, based on how well the learner is performing. Um, so we asked ourselves, uh, okay. <laughs> well, so we asked ourselves, how can we uh, scale this form of personalized learning for mo learning of motor skills? Uh, or in other words, um, uh, how can we build like a physical version of the online adaptive systems that already exist and that uh, sort of give a way of scaling personalized learning? Um, if if we look at the um, if we look at the um, uh, the space of systems that provide motor skill learning today, most of them are sort of uh, focused on giving feedback. So, for example, the one on the left um, uh, tracks the position of uh, your uh, posture and uh, the sound while you're learning violin, and kind of gives you a haptic feedback of whether you're doing better or worse. Uh, the second one gives a visual feedback of your posture uh, while you're trying to learn the right position for snowboarding. Uh, and the third one on the right gives like an audiovisual feedback on uh, your postures while batting. But we were more interested in uh, not the feedback systems, but we were more interested in uh, building a, a, a physical version of the online adaptive systems where the task difficulty is adapted based on the performance. So our idea was, um, let me show you with the example of this basketball. Our idea was, uh, what if while, okay, this might have to be clicked from here. Uh, oh, it did. Okay. Yeah, so what if like while learning the skill of like just scoring a basketball, we can change the tool itself to uh, make it harder. So we can make the hoop smaller as you start scoring the, um, the basketball, or we can make the hoop height higher. And eventually, as the learner gets better and better at the skill, we, get, we make the task more and more difficult over time. And the idea is to make sure that the task is never too hard nor too easy for the learner. And at every point, the difficulty is at an optimal challenge point. Uh, it kind of gives you the uh, maxim maximum potential of uh, learning. 
So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to address the two main research questions we addressed in our work. One was, do these kind of adaptive training tools that vary task difficulty actually lead to a higher learning gain? And in order to address this question, we conducted a user study for, uh, to measure the learning gain uh, of adaptive versus static. Uh, we improved our adaptation algorithm to make it more optimized. Um, and then we conducted another user study to test whether the new algorithm was actually effective or not. And then the second part of the uh, research question was, uh, how do we actually help designers to build more and more of these uh, adaptive systems, adaptive training tools? And to address that question, uh, we build a UI that can help designers uh, deploy our learning algorithm on uh, different uh, adaptive tools. Uh, and then I'll show like, some examples that we built in our lab and a few more examples that our students built um, and like, different application scenarios. So coming back to our question of do adaptive training uh, tools actually lead to higher learning gains? Um, so recall that what we are trying to focus on is uh, vary the, the, the physical, physically adapt the tool uh, and vary the task difficulty level, uh, and then sense whether the performance gets better or, uh, or worse. And before we delve deeper, there are two things, uh, there are two terms we need to like, uh, take into consideration. One is nominal task difficulty, and the second one is functional task difficulty. So the nominal task difficulty is basically like general uh, difficulty levels. They're pretty much universal, and they're invariant of the individual skill levels. So for example, it could be a beginner level, expert level, intermediate level, which are the nomen um, terms used universally. Or in, for example, for ski slopes, we have, uh, uh, we have like a blue, blue ski slope and a black one, which sort of uh, gives you how hard or how easy this, the, the task is. Um, functional task difficulty, on the other hand, is very subjective to the learner's skill levels. So for example, you could be, uh, th there could be two people uh, testing on a medium level of difficulty, but a beginner person would have a higher functional task difficulty because it's a, it's, it's a, it's a more harder task for them. Uh, whereas for an expert, this, the functional task difficulty might be much lower. So our goal is basically to take the learner from a beginner level to an expert level by maintaining the functional task difficulty at an optimal challenge point for that learner. And that is what makes the learning process uh, personalized. So, um, and the studies have shown that when we train on the optimal challenge, around the optimal challenge point, uh, the, the benefit of, uh, the potential of learning is maximum. So uh, in a sense, this graph shows that as the functional task difficulty gets higher, uh, performance tends to drop. But then there is one point where it's actually optimized, where the performance is right, is not too high, but it's not too low, and the difficulty is not too hard and not too easy. And that's the kind of area we want to, we want to always train at. So in our first user study, uh, we basically um, uh, uh, used the same basketball example, and we uh, tested for two conditions. One condition was static training, and the second condition was an adaptive training. And in order to uh, compensate for the different uh, learning skills that uh, the participants would have, we first calibrated the distance from which the user study would be conducted. Uh, and then the study was conducted in five stages. So first stage was pre-training skill assessment test, where the uh, participant had to attempt 20 throws at the hardest setting of the basketball. And the hardest setting essentially here means the highest height uh, of the hoop and the smallest hoop size. Uh, in, then uh, we would uh, train them either on adaptive first or on static first. Uh, adaptive would basically start off with an easier setting and based on their performance, it would either go higher or easier and eventually go or maybe not even reach the highest setting within 80 attempts. So both the training conditions were for 80 attempts. And then after every condition, we tested them again in the hardest setting to see whether there was a learning gain or not. Uh, we recruited 12 participants. Most of them were MIT students. Um, and some of them had a prior uh, basketball experience and some of them did not. Um, uh, another thing to notice was that in the static condition, we, uh, uh, we, um, test, uh, we trained them uh, for uh, 40 attempts in the easiest setting and 40 attempts in the hardest setting. Uh, and uh, for the first uh, part, for the first user study, we used a very naive algorithm of adaptation. So we tested, we recorded the score after every four attempts, and based on their score, 
uh, we either made it easier or harder by uh, changing the hoop size or be, by changing or uh, the height. And in terms of scoring, we scored a basket as one point, and we scored a board hit as a partial point, so 0.5, uh, because we thought that's almost like reaching the, the, the skill. Um, interestingly, uh, we got like very promising results, and we saw the learning gain after the um, uh, adaptive training was a lot higher, was significantly higher compared to the static one. And um, not only that, when we, uh, tra uh, when we um, recorded the average uh, performance over the 80 attempts of all the 12 participants, we noticed that uh, when trained on adaptive training, which is the blue line here, was always between 0.5 and 0.75, which is kind of what we want. Ideally, we would want it between like 0.75 and 1, uh, because that's kind of saying that the task was never too hard, but not too easy. Whereas the green one is the static training, where it was either too easy and they were constantly scoring and potentially not learning anything, or it was too hard where they were not scoring at all and potentially, again, not learning anything. Um, and more than the quantitative uh, results, uh, the qualitative feedback was very encouraging. So most of the participants preferred to learn on an adaptive training mode. Uh, and not only that, they had very interesting feedback where you know, one of them said that, oh, no one was watching me outside of the lab setting, and you know, it made them feel very comfortable. Or the changes in the hoop was really cool. It was sort of like having a personal trainer motivate me. Um, and again, there were things like, oh, adaptive mode was useful in slowly adjusting me to get better and better at harder shots. So it kind of showed that there was value in adaptive training. Um, however, when we like, did post-talk analysis of our uh, results and we split the two groups, uh, the group that was trained on adaptive first and the group that was trained on static first, we noticed that the significant learning was only in the first group, which was trained on the adaptive condition first. It kind of said that our algorithm was not optimized because there is a potential for the second group to learn as well. Uh, and then when we plotted every uh, participant's score, so on this, uh, the x-axis is basically the pre-training score, and the y-axis is the percentage of improvement after that training. And the orange uh, dots are basically the um, uh, post-adaptive performance, and the blue ones are post-static uh, performance. So ideally, what we want is all the dots to be in the positive area, because you want uh, positive improvement in the performance. But if you notice, in the second group, there are some participants that had reduction in their, uh, in their, in their um, performance. So we kind of don't want that. It kind of like, um, so it kind of implied that our algorithm was not essentially optimized, uh, and we changed our algorithm. So instead of ca counting every four attempts, we changed it to uh, counting a running window, uh, a running average of four attempts. And basically, as your uh, and we we plotted the average and uh, calculated the derivative. So the idea was, as your performance starts plateauing, we would see whether it's plateauing at a higher range or a lower range. If it's plateauing at a lower range, it means you're kind of stuck in a very difficult setting, and we made we adapted to it. Uh, we adapted the tool to be easier. And if it's too high, it kind of means that okay, you've learned the skill at this level. Let's make your task difficulty harder. Uh, and the idea is to all constantly keep it between around like 0.5 to points, uh, 0.75 to 1. Um, yeah. uh, and after having deployed this uh, algorithm, we did another usage study. And this time we kind of, instead of testing for uh, adaptive to, man, uh, to static, we did adaptive, which is auto-adaptive using our algorithm, versus auto-adaptive for, um, uh, for the participants where, uh, sorry, manually adaptive for the participants, where they could choose whatever stage they wanted to train at, at whatever moment of training. So uh, the setup was very similar again, where we pre-calibrated for the distance. Then uh, we did 20 attempts of uh, pre-training skill assessment. Uh, we did 80 attempts of training, either in auto-adaptive or manually adaptive and then post-training again. So at the end of it, every participant had 220 throws. Uh, we again recruited 12 new participants, those that had no idea of the, or had not experienced the first user study. Uh, again, most of them were MIT students, and uh, we got very, very promising results where the learning gain was much higher compared to the first study. Uh, and not only that, it was, not only was it significantly higher, 
Um, there were some very interesting observations as well. It turns out people are really bad at assessing their own skill level and uh, kind of figuring what level of difficulty they should train at. Uh, it could probably also be because they were MIT students and they were very ambitious. So this participant particularly adjusted to a very high setting right in the beginning. So the right side is the manual adaptive mode and the red lines show uh, adapting to a higher uh, difficult one and green one shows that it was easier. And if you see the scoring, because the person was scoring earlier, it just went directly straight to like the hardest mode. And then the person struggled a lot by you know, not really scoring anything at all. Whereas in the adaptive mode, the same person had a very sequential and a very regular adaptation. Uh, adaptation. And if you see, the scoring was always between 0.5 and, uh, and, and 1. So it kind of said that uh, the goal that we had of always making sure that the difficulty level is neither too easy nor too hard is, is kind of uh, was achieved. And the person actually ended up performing better um, after the auto adaptive mode. Um, and again, like the qualitative feedback was also very promising. Um, and it was also interesting because some of them said that, oh, somehow I trust the auto-adaptive a lot more um, than myself. And maybe I should, as suggested by my score. Or even things like, uh, I felt myself getting better and think this would be like a really fun thing to have as a kid. Um, Again, uh, and the other person was, uh, oh, the auto-adaptive mode was easier to use. I didn't have to think on what uh, about like what, how I'm doing or where I should be. Right now, I just had to like practice. Um, in terms of preferences, again, like most of the um, uh, participants preferred the auto-adaptive mode over the manually adaptive one. Um, and when we did the postdoc analysis, we uh, kind of uh, discovered that we had significant learning gain now in both the uh, groups, the group that was trained in adapt auto adaptive first and the group that had freedom to train on whatever setting they wanted, so the manually adaptive one. And that's kind of what we were aiming at. Um, and when we plotted every uh, participant score, uh, as you can see, except for one person there, most of them had like a positive um, improvement. Someone as uh, for some people as high as like 120 percent, which is like pretty significantly high. Um, so uh, to conclude, like our uh, our uh, design, uh, our, our question of whether uh, adaptive uh, tools are beneficial in learning or not, uh, it turns out that uh, our studies show that it, it's it's a very beneficial way uh, and very effective way of learning of motor skills, where you sense the performance, uh, you compute the next difficulty level, uh, you adapt to the next uh, uh, next hardest setting, and you idea is to always maintain the optimal challenge point. Um, so having addressed the first part of the research question, now we know that, okay, it's effective. The next question was, okay, how do we now help designers build these kind of adaptive tools? Um, and to address this, we kind of, uh, through our experience, we kind of uh, provided high-level design guidelines. Uh, and these guidelines would be for designers who would and we, we hope that these designers would work with expert coaches or trainers to uh, fine tune the design. But the idea is to first understand what is aspect of the motor skill is being learned, uh, which sensors effectively monitor this aspect of learning, uh, what kind of physical support uh, reduces the difficulty level. So for example, in basketball, we used piezo sensors and switch sensors to kind of detect whether the basket is being scored or the board is being hit. And uh, we adapted the uh, tool uh, using motors by changing the height and changing the hoop. And then you would select the actuators accordingly for the design and fabrication of these tools. So, um, and once you have these decisions made, these high level de design decisions made, we built a UI where you basically can select uh, any sensor that you're using in your design. And we had a bunch of like eight or 10 sensors to choose from. Uh, you would adjust the states. The states would basically be, oh, this was a successful attempt or this was a failed attempt. And then you kind of map that setting with the actuators. And the actuators, we have about like four or five of them, uh, including servo motors, step stepper motors, relay, LED, pneumatic, pump, et cetera. And then uh, the, uh, the idea is you basically just export, you press the export button, and then uh, the code gets generated that can be deployed on your Arduino uh, microprocessor, and then uh, you can have an adaptive tool uh, uh, fabricated. So let me just show you the same example of how we fabricated uh, our basketball tool using the same uh, approach. And I'm going to click from here. 
So, um, oops. So designers can start by registering the sensors and the states. So this was for the switch. And then the actuators. So this is for the stepper motor. Uh, sorry, servo motor. And then this is for the stepper motor. So you can adjust all the states. And then basically like uh, have the code generated that can be deployed and then um, we also provide a visualization tool where you can track the performance and you can see when the tool is getting adapted and when the tool is getting harder or easier and whether it's doing at the optimal stage or not. Um, so uh, to again summarize the workflow, it's basically you select sensors, you select the right actuators, uh, you build a prototype, you use our UI to deploy the algorithm, and you use our visualization tool to kind of evaluate the ad uh, adaptation. Um, correct. So now to show that our idea is generalizable over different uh, uh, prototypes and different applications, we built a few examples in our lab. So this one's an adaptive bike. Oh, I think it doesn't, yeah, I'm gonna have a click from here. So this one's an adaptive bike, which kind of senses how well you're balancing, and then based on that, raises or lowers the training wheels. And we've used hall sensor here to measure how often you're using the training wheels. And as the learner improves in balancing, the wheels go higher and higher, and eventually you would not need them at all. Okay. And this uh, slide basically shows how our UI can be used to deploy the algorithm that can, uh, that can convert the bike into an adaptive bike. Uh, our idea can be used also not just for sports, but for various um, uh, purposes of like rehabilitation of motor skills, um, especially after like uh, physical injuries. So generally, like a, a wobble board is used to um, help you regain the sense of balance. And okay, I'm gonna have to click again. So um, this wobble board has an inflatable support and we deflate and inflate the support based on how well the person learns to um, balance. So this is in the most deflated when it's very hard to like balance. Um, and we measure the balancing using distance sensor. And if we, it's not really seen in this, but like the cushion underneath is getting inflated and deflated to provide more support or less support. And this shows how our uh, UI can be used to like, uh, deploy that algorithm on the, uh, on the wobble board. And so far, I've shown only uh, prototypes that have been uh, standalone. Uh, but this idea can also be used for wearables. For example, imagine an inflatable armband uh, that kind of prevents you from bend bending your arm. And this especially is helpful for like, learning golf swing, where you tend to uh, bend your arm a lot in the beginning. So. Uh, this one is, yeah. So we measure the bending using flex sensors. And then if the, bend, uh, if the learner bends the arm, you inflate the arm and that kind of uh, prevents you from bending it. And this kind of shows how, this, uh, how our UI can be used to deploy the algorithm on the, for the golf armband. Um, but we were also interested in you know, going outside of our lab environment and seeing like, if given this tool, how can people use it to be more creative and what kind of ideas and applications could be developed. So Stephanie taught a studio, a class, uh, 6810, where um, uh, we, had, uh, we had a group project, uh, and the group was about like two to, two, one to two students, uh, and the assignment was to develop adaptive um, uh, objects for like learning of some motor skill. And uh, it was, I think, like about six or eight weeks of uh, project, uh, project length. And uh, the students were required to come up with like 10 ideas each. So in the, in the beginning, we started off with 250 possible ideas of applying this concept in various applications. Uh, but eventually, each group uh, narrowed down to like a single project idea. And it was very interesting to see the diversity. And it, you know, it went from everything like, uh, learning how to swim using an adaptive floaty, 
or uh, my favorite is learning how to wear a uh, walk in heels, uh, or uh, adaptive gloves that kind of teach you uh, sign language, um, to learning how to play piano, or even fencing, and, um, or even creative things like adaptive drawing tool. Um, and these were like the uh, initial concept ideas, and the final prototypes were, uh, these are the final prototypes that the students built. Um, again, like going from adaptive con hole to skateboard uh, to an adaptive pitching machine, um, even adaptive ping pong. And uh, like I said, a few of my favorites are this adaptive heels, where they measure how well you're balancing uh, while walking. And based on if you learn how to balance in a given height, uh, then the motor sort of increase the height of, the, of those heels. And eventually, you would learn how to walk. I wish I had that when I was like learning how to walk in heels. Um, but then the, uh, we also show how our UI can be d uh, used to deploy the same algorithm for uh, this, um, uh, this prototype. Uh, this is another one where, which I also think is very creative. Uh, it's for like learning how to play piano, but basically the keys get raised, uh, the keys that need to be pressed get raised higher, and eventually, as you learn how to press the right key, uh, the the raising decreases over time. So the support kind of decreases over time. Uh, and then this is the final one, uh, where, uh, which is also, I think, is very clever design, uh, is an adaptive skateboard, where the length of the skateboard uh, where the length of the skateboard uh, adapts based on how well you learn to like navigate and how well you learn how to balance. Um, so in summary, uh, basically uh, our idea can be applied into like di different applications, and we envision that in future it's not just limited to uh, the design of the tool, but it can be extended to the entire ecosystem of motor skills. For example, even the ball could be adaptive. Or if you're playing golf, then your golf club could be adaptive, and maybe the gloves could be adaptive. And like the whole system, the, all these tools could communicate with each other and eventually become like a whole ecosystem. And we also envision that uh, right now we are uh, focusing on a personal and individualized learning, but this could be implemented in a group of learners, especially in sports where you can have the, uh, the tool adapt to um, different combinations of like, uh, people and with different uh, learning skills or different uh, skill levels. So in summary, I uh, addressed two main questions in my talk. One was, uh, can adaptive uh, tools lead to uh, higher learning gains? And then the second one was how I showed how we built UI uh, to help designers build adaptive uh, training tools. And our vision is that one day, you know, our tools would like kind of maybe, if not replace, would supplement like the trainers and um, the learning of motor skills could be made more scalable and accessible uh, the way online learning tools uh, make learning of math and languages more accessible to everyone. Yeah, uh, that's it. And from the, uh, and I'll hand over to like Stephanie for the second part of the project. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Sorry, that's the wrong side. Ah, perfect. All right, so I just want to give a quick preview of the project we just started, which is in the realm also of adaptive learning, but learning maker skills by building game props. So there have been a lot of recent advances in um, virtual physical gameplay. So a lot of games already use like game props, but the, for instance, the Nintendo Labo recently made this accessible by providing these cardboard cutouts that players can just assemble and then use in a game. So for instance, here you see a fun um, example of how they use their game console um, where the player builds a fishing rod and then as you turn the fishing rod, you can pull out a fish there from the game. So today, these um, physical props that you use in the game are mainly used for immersion. So it's just more fun for the kids to play the game. So the new aspect we want to explore is can we use those game props to actually teach um, learners making skills, such as fabrication or electronics. So if you compare this again, this is what uh, kids or learners in general would do, uh, kids or players would do today. They get these pre-made cardboard kits that you just like open, they come in the mail, you, you stencil them out and you fold them up. And then you take the game control and you just attach it and you're done, right? And that's really all they do at the beginning of the game and then they can play the game. So our idea is, to rather use self-made parts during the game. So let's say they start playing the game, 
and then they can use for instance, a cutting plotter or here if somebody is on campus at a fab lab can actually make those parts as part of the gameplay. And then again, for the sensing, rather than using this um, standard game controller where there really is no learning of skills, can we tell people, for instance, how to wire up a mini circuit like a button or a dial to slowly like, smooth them into building props for their games? So the, the high level research question we want to answer with this is how can the act of building a physical game prop actually teach players some making skills? So our collaborators for this project um, are both the MIT Game Lab, which I'm really excited about because they really bring in this expertise of where in the game those making tasks would make sense. And then we are also going to work with the new Innovation School. They sit at Central Square, um, which is a really awesome environment for kids to take either a full semester or a year off to really dive into two-week studio projects. So in this school environment, there are no classes. They really just have this like, project-based um, building, environment, uh, building environments. So here's the research plan we're going to do. So for the choice of games, I already mentioned that we're going to um, focus for now on the um, Nintendo Labo platform and their games. So you can see there's really a, a diverse set of different choices there from, I already mentioned the fishing rod. Uh, rod. You can use a camera, motorcycle, cardboard made piano, even like a little birdhouse. And rather than just giving kids those pre-made parts, we're going to investigate how they can build it up progressively throughout the game. So here are the steps we plan to take. So the first one is obviously we have to first identify where in the game it actually makes sense to have a making task, right? So a bunch of examples are, could there be a new game piece be generated during the game that you can physically make? Um, could you expand the game board or the game world with uh, something you make? Could you reveal a hidden object that just suddenly appears in the game, right? It's not just digital, you can actually physically make it. Could we give you a trophy or a memento at the end of a level, for instance, you can pin on a wall and be like really proud about? Or can we personalize your game piece or the player's avatar during the game? So maybe as you get better at fishing, you get extra things for your fishing rod you can attach or something like this. So then, um, the second really important part is, okay, once we know um, what are good making moments in the game, what do we actually want to teach? Yeah, and that's actually a very interesting question because there's no real official like making curriculum for beginners, right? So obviously a lot of classes here on campus where everybody tries to teach making, but if you look at the curriculum, it's actually very diverse. So one question we, or one activity we will have as part of this is to talk to a bunch of these um, either the Nuvu School of Innovation that I already talked about, or here on campus, the Maker Lodge training, Beaver Works, or just Fab Labs, and see what are their strategies for teaching those making skills. Okay, then the third part is, okay, we know, know what we want to teach, we have some moments in the game, but how can we actually build up learning over time throughout the game? So this ties uh, back to what Ashita talked about, the adaptive learning, right? How can we break this down into like easy tasks, medium level tasks, harder tasks? Um, throughout the game uh, play. So here are some examples, for instance, um, let's say you have to make um, a certain object. If you're a beginner, maybe the game engine just gives you the file for making. All you do is you just make it. Yeah? Um, maybe if you're a little more expert, you just get like a partial drawing, maybe you have to complete it at the joints or at some mechanism. And if you're an expert, maybe you, maybe you only get the dimensions and that's it. So then the fourth task is, okay, once a person made something, how can we actually know if they did it correctly? Yeah, and that's actually a pretty challenging implementation um, question for us. So if there's something about the you know, design stage, can we track somehow the drawing or the modeling program? If they go to the fabrication settings, um, can we track if they use the right power or speed settings? And then during the fabrication stage, do we actually know that they pressed the right buttons and the thing actually came out uh, correctly? So maybe we can build some plugins for like the design programs or we can add some cameras and sensing to the devices uh, to figure this out. Great, then we will build the game infrastructure. So this is also interesting because um, there's a lot of game infrastructure there, but no game infrastructure that can talk to fabrication devices, right? So how is this um, unified environment going to look like? Then we're going to do some user testing at this um, school, which I think is very exciting. So the idea is we will build three um, games at the beginning. Then we go to the school, we have kids um, test the games. And then after they got an idea of what we mean with this um, making 
skills through playing games. We will actually ask them to brainstorm their own games. So again, I think it's very useful to include the students in this process because they will just generate a lot more ideas than we could come up just as a small team. And then the last step for us is um, to explore if we can actually extend this to other types of games and fabrication devices. So we just start with like cutting plotters, and maybe laser cutters because that's easy, it's 2D. Um, but how about, for instance, 3D printing or other fabrication devices and other types of games, let's say augmented reality. So this is uh, one fun example um, which we brainstormed a few weeks back. Um, the idea is maybe you play this AR game here in the environment and you discover all the parts for a spotlight. So now the game engine will give you the files for actually making the spotlight. So you laser cut it, you assemble it. And as you manage to assemble it, the game will know you now have it in your hand. And as you swipe it around in AR, maybe you can see something new and you collect something. All right, so um, this is just to give a brief like, introduction to the second project. Again, we are just starting out. If you're interested in any part of this, we would love to brainstorm um, more in this um, area. So just to sum this up, um, so rather than using like, pre-cut parts and pre-cut game controller, we will basically ask people to make everything themselves as part of a learning process in the game. Do we have one more slide? Uh, okay. <laughs> All right, so that's it uh, from us, and we would love if you have any questions or Q&A, um, you know, let us know we are here.